Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Delighted to be welcoming you at this last uh, panel of the, this year uh, IDM. I'm very happy not to be alone on the panel and uh, to uh, shortly introduce uh, my co-panelist. And uh, obviously, uh, it's the end of the panel. I hope that uh, we will be able to compensate the fatigue of a long session with a very lively and uh, uh, interactive discussion. As has just been uh, mentioned, uh, the, the current uh, pandemic has brought about a completely different dimension in our work. Uh, all of us had to really start working, uh, uh, especially us working on migration and looking at this uh, situation in, from different perspective. And this, uh, the United Nations uh, make no exception. And uh, as we know uh, as well, and has been uh, echoing uh, several times, the pandemic is anything but uh, uh, equalitarian. And we know that there are disproportions and diversity in the way it's been basically affecting communities at all levels and uh, uh, exacerbating conflict, contrast, uh, disproportionately affecting certain groups, including migrants. So, and this actually might also uh, brought about, bring about a, a, a serious setback in uh, our uh, aspiration and prospect of uh, seeing the global compact of migration, uh, uh, safe, orderly, and regular migration actually becoming a reality being implemented by states and the international community and partners. As the United Nations, as uh, all of you know, has actually come together under the, the call of the Secretary General in 2018, and has established a network of migration bringing together 34 entities of the UN. And uh, this work has actually been taking uh, several uh, aspects and uh, uh, one of obviously important uh, facets that I want to uh, mention today obviously is the Champion Initiative. Champion Initiative is a group of actually like-minded countries that have actually decided to come together to uh, uh, take uh, forward the implementation of the, uh, of the Global Compact. I'm uh, delighted to uh, have, obviously, uh, the uh, ambassador of uh, um, Portugal and also the ambassador of Mexico that have been both very active in the various phases. But uh, we saw that, obviously, this, uh, as I mentioned, could be really a, a serious setback for the implementation of the Global Compact if we don't, don't try to see uh, this new situation in two different perspectives. Obviously, the first important one is to consider how uh, vulnerable and uh, how badly uh, migrant group, individual and community are actually being affected by the pandemic. But also to see on the reverse, and as we mentioned in, uh, time and again, what is the big potential and the big uh, po potential benefits, uh, uh, Canada just mentioned one, that migrant actually can uh, bring about uh, to uh, uh, the communities in uh, uh, the time of a, a health emergency. The United Nations uh, is very, uh, a network is very aware of this uh, situation and has uh, uh, re-adjusted re, uh, its uh, is responded to the COVID-19 in, in this crisis to basically revamp its approach to support member states actually to, uh, to see really the broadly the mobility uh, issue in time of the COVID. One of the uh, um, experiment, one of the activity that will be soon uh, being presented is uh, uh, the uh, policy brief that we have actually, as, as a network, uh, uh, developed that analyzed the impact of COVID uh, on human mobility and suge suggest also uh, how the global compact can be leveraged to effectively respond and help the recovery by offering policy recommendations to, to partner. Obviously, uh, the UN are not alone in this effort. Uh, and a very important uh, and, I would say, essential role is being played, obviously, by the civil society. We will be hearing, obviously, here the, the important uh, uh, contribution and experience. And I would like also to mention, obviously, the, uh, the local dimension of mobility. Uh, today, uh, in the panel, we'll be hearing the experience and the work of two uh, prominent cities, um, Accra and Rabat. But uh, since uh, obviously uh, we have uh, not much time, I would like really not to linger any, any longer on that. I would like to ask uh, my two colleagues uh, working obviously on the UN Network for Migration, uh, Cecilia Riallant, of the, uh, the head of the um, Sustainable Development Unit of the IUM, 
and David Kudur, uh, the, the, region, the senior regional advisor of uh, uh, UNDP, to give us a quick illustration just to set the stage. And then actually I will uh, uh, try to navigate among the uh, members of the panel to try to have a, as a comprehensive and uh, inclusive discussion as, uh, as possible. Cecile, David, uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Maurizio. So we are, we are going to be using a, a PowerPoint that is now uh, projected on your screen. Um, so if we could move, to, move on to the first slide, please. So indeed, um, my role and the one of uh, David from, uh, from UNDP today is to present you some of the main messages uh, that are coming out of this really important policy brief from the UN Network on Migration, uh, really stressing how well governed migration is and should be an essential element of effective COVID-19 response. I think as it has been said quite eloquently by, by a number of speakers before us, really we can see that the pandemic has um, exposed our reliance on migration for our health, our food and our economy with many migrants on the front lines of the response. And yet the pandemic has disproportionately impacted people on the move, uh, which have really found themselves caught in the middle of three interlocking crises, a health crisis, a social economic crisis and a protection crisis. And all of that has just reinforced existing uh, and, and prevailing vulnerabilities. Um, so as you, get, you, you have here on the, on the screen, an important message from our Secretary General that has really you know, said that COVID-19 crisis could actually present us with an opportunity to reimagine human mobility for the benefit of all. But we have really first to overcome the fact that the disjointed mobility restrictions and forced around the world to control the transmission of the virus have let, let us a little bit to lose sight of essential elements of effective migration governance. So we need to bring back the recognition of the centrality of migration for joint prosperity. If we could go to the next slide, please. So, and this is where, of course, the, the Global Compact on Migration takes, uh, you know, central stage. Um, as it is really anchored in the 2030 agenda, the GCM provides us really with an important framework through which governments, but also other stakeholders, can strengthen migration governance. So through its 23 objectives, uh, we can address migration from a 360 degree perspective, underscoring the relevance of the GCM. To, to help us deal with numerous areas of sustainable development. So this is really, through the GCM, an opportunity to reaffirm these uh, commitments and really to take action to enact uh, effective responses to COVID-19. Indeed, with this, we can the GCM can help us mitigate the negative impact of COVID-19. It can help us to build stronger, more inclusive and resilient communities, and also to stimulate strong socioeconomic uh, recovery. So I'm now you know, handing over to, to David to really walk us through how the GCM can guide the member states, the UN and other stakeholders uh, for inclusive COVID-19 preparedness, prevention, response and recovery measures. So over to you, David. Thanks, Cecile. Uh, colleagues, uh, I mean, we, we fully agree with uh, the fact that the gates uh, the gates cannot stay closed forever and that we need a more human mobility to help uh, economies recover from the COVID-19 crisis. Um, the contribution of migrants to many economies around the world uh, has been uh, even more obvious than ever during the, the COVID crisis. And uh, in this respect, meeting the objectives of the Global Compact on Migration can only help spur development in countries of origin, transit and destination. Uh, so what does this imply concretely? Uh, first, it's, uh, it's key, and if you can please uh, move the slide, thank you. Uh, it's, it's, it's key to promote regular pathways. We have seen during the crisis that uh, many migrants uh, stayed uh, stranded in different parts, and uh, we have a, a real big issue. So we, we need um, we need to, to return to normality in terms of uh, regular pathways and more than normality uh, to have uh, more of these uh, legal pathways. We also need to facilitate fair and ethical recruitment to ensure decent work. Uh, 
uh, we have good examples. And at, at some point, the, the COVID-19 crisis has been also a good opportunity to develop uh, good policies. We have in, in Asian countries uh, the migrant worker resource centers, which have been very, very uh, active in uh, helping uh, migrants and uh, protect their rights during the, the lockdowns and the, the social distancing measures and to have access to uh, decent jobs. Um, it's also important to invest in skills development and facilitate the mutual recognition of uh, skills. In, in this respect, in, uh, in South America, the examples of Argentina and Peru are, are, are very interesting because they decided that to face the crisis, they they recognized the, the skills of uh, the Venezuelan health workers so that they could support the health response in times of uh, crisis. And uh, something that was blocked for many years uh, was accelerated in this time of crisis. Um, it's also important for, to, to rely on the con contribution uh, uh, for migrants to, or the possibility for migrants to contribute to the development in their countries of origin and not just in countries of destination. Um, how we can better engage diasporas into uh, the development, uh, development initiatives in their origin uh, communities. And uh, also the crisis has shown that uh, the importance of remittances Remittances uh, has uh, decreased significantly in many countries. So how can we lower this cost and facilitate remittance transfers? So all that is obviously in line with uh, the different uh, uh, GCM objectives. And we see even more than ever the relevance of these uh, GCM objectives. Um, in addition, what uh, COVID-19 has, has demonstrated, and if you can change slide, please, uh, is also the cost of uh, no integration. Uh, we have seen that when migrants are not uh, integrated, uh, that means more exclusion for them, more vulnerability, and also at the end, uh, more fragility for the economy. So uh, it's, it's very important to promote uh, migrants' uh, integration, uh, economic integration, social integration, uh, to promote uh, legal identity and adequate uh, documentation is, uh, is really uh, key. Uh, at the end, we have also learned during this uh, pandemic that nobody should be excluded from uh, basic services. This is true in general, and this is even truer in uh, cases of, um, in times of, uh, of pandemic. Uh, we have the, the good example of uh, Canada, in particular in Quebec, with uh, the, 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 the implementation of free clinics where people, including migrants uh, without uh, documents, could go, have tests, be tested, and have uh, information about the, the, the disease. So that was very important. Um, we also have um, uh, very good practices in terms of access to, to education. It's important to have inclusive education uh, systems. Uh, children around the world have been uh, particularly hit by, uh, by the social distancing uh, measures, the lockdowns, and migrant children even more. So um, th this is important to provide access to, to everybody. Uh, in Greece, for instance, uh, they, they developed an on online learning platform with guidelines in 10 languages in a way that... Um, all uh, migrants who understand what, uh, how to connect and uh, how to benefit from these uh, learning platforms. Um, access to social protection, I think <clears throat> there is no need to, to, to explain why it's uh, important. We have shown how so many uh, thousands uh, of uh, migrants have been excluded uh, around the world of uh, access to social safety nets because they didn't uh, benefit from, from social protection. So uh, we need to, to provide access to, to that and, and also to facilitate the portability of, uh, of rights. Um, and, and finally, um, social cohesion is key. We have also seen during the, the COVID-19 that uh, um, there is a lack of trust across communities, so we need really to, to strengthen social cohesion, to, to <clears throat> promote cultural activities, uh, involve the different stakeholders, different sectors, and, 
and build uh, this trust across uh, uh, migrants and host communities. And 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 finally, um, so the the point is that. Uh, uh, the global compact on migration is not just uh, it's not a theoretical framework it has really concrete uh, applications and uh, and we have seen them during the covid-19 crisis and we have to strengthen strengthen that after the covid-19 crisis hopefully it will be soon the after covid-19 crisis um, this response uh, is in line with the UN socio-economic uh, response in terms of health, in terms of social protection, in terms of access to jobs, um, in the, the macroeconomic response and, uh, and the social cohesion pillars are, are really connected with uh, what we have in the, in the GCN. And at the end, all that is going to contribute to, uh, to reaching or fulfilling the sustainable development goals. Um, <clears throat> we have a decade for action to reach 2030. The decade for action really started very badly, uh, but now it's time to speed up and, uh, and, and, and to have uh, all, uh, all countries uh, working in that direction. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Cecile and uh, David, and uh, bringing some concrete example how the GCM is really not, uh, aside, uh, uh, far from being an hindrance, actually could be really an accelerator of recovery and uh, response uh, to to the current pan pandemics for uh, uh, many countries. And uh, as we know, uh, uh, the one of the the, the, the heaviest uh, uh, burden has been uh, borne by cities and local communities at both uh, sending and receiving uh, uh, le uh, level. And uh, I would like to invite uh, now uh, the uh, Honorable uh, Mohamed Sadir Sadiki, the President of the Communal Council of the City of Rabat, to illustrate what actually is the experience uh, of Rabat, in particular uh, on how to uh, uh, the experience, including international and horizontal cooperation, that can actually be uh, effective in, in the current context. Uh, Monsieur le Maire, vous avez la parole. Mayor, you have the floor. You're right. <clears throat> I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you very well. Yes. Thank you for having uh, brought us into this very important meeting so that we can share the experience of the city of Rabat in how we have dealt with migration. Immigration is a significant uh, place uh, in uh, public policy now, both on an international, national and local level. And it requires adequate strategies to ensure it is treated efficiently and humanely. This strategy must look at coexisting well together for all the populations, and we have to consider them all having the same level of dignity. Therefore, municipalities are more than ever called on to play a major role in the implementation of these strategies. Within Rabat, we have worked on five programs. The first program is Action, and it's the project Recommin, which is carried out in partnership with the Ministry for Moroccans Abroad and Migration Matters and the Ministry of the Interior and financed by the German federal ministry and it looks at the national strategy for my immigration and asylum with an approach on a territorial level that aims to create at a local level a favorable context for the social cultural and economic integration of migrants to ensure that we have good social cohesion this was uh, set up through the implementation, implementation of training for actors in the city of Rabat. And then we worked on another project, which is the Rekosan 
project where we look at building capacity of territorial collectivities to improve uh, the structures for hosting and welcoming the migrants. So within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, looking at international affairs, in particular taking care of Moroccans abroad, the community of Rabat is involved with the German corporation GIZ to build capacities for territorial collectivities to ensure that we improve the hosting structures. The project, the pilot project, aims to integrate migrants, refugees, and returning Moroccans through the use of sport as a tool and vector for inter integration. The third project is NCDUCM. And this is for migration between cities and looking at the migratory flows of migrants. We've been working with SCNPD, the European Union and the, uh, the Swiss Corporation Agency. And we looked at the factual data on migration and aims to set up the African Observatory for Migration in Rabat in partnership with UN Habitat. The fourth project is the Council of Mayors for Migration, MMC. And then we're also looking at the framework of social economic integration of migrants in partnership with the Council of Mayors for Migration, MMC. And the International Conference of Rabat with the, the Council of Europe, local powers, CPNR, where the city of Rabat was one of the first communities to take on this issue and to help migrants to integrate the labor market and to achieve a dignified and suitable living conditions. And the conference organized by the city of Rabat and the local and regional authorities of the Council of Europe, we worked under the theme of building an inclusive community where we wanted to integrate, integrate migrants and fight against extremism. And in November 2017, we worked on strengthening local and regional democracy through this. And the last project is the project of action which was started by the city of Rabat with bilateral cooperation, city to city. The project mainly concerns cooperation, decentralized cooperation between the city and the capital Rabat. And it's based on strengthening the, in a sustainable manner, the capacities in Rabat with our policies for neighborhood cohesion. We have uh, a lot of areas with many migrants and we're working there. And the aim of the project is to strengthen the efficiency of municipal action within Rabat in terms of looking at the social potential through better potential through better coordination of actions and the centralization of data in the area the professionalization of human resources and coordination of actions. So finally, we'd like to thank the organizers for having allowed us to join this important meeting. And we are most attentive to this meeting. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Mayor. We'd like to thank you for your information on the strategies that munici municipalities in the city of Rabat have put together and the description of the importance of the uh, horizontal coherence across governmental and non-governmental organizations and also the vertical integration between municipalities and central government, including the importance of international partnerships. Thank you very much. I'm now very, very pleased to uh, uh, introduce uh, um, the ambassador of Mexico. 
the uh, Madame uh, Socorro Flores uh, Lieira, the permanent representative uh, of, of Mexico to the United Nations in Geneva, and Ambassador, the, uh, Mexico has ob 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 obviously been one of the countries that has been uh, uh, supporting the global compact uh, from the outset through obviously your role as co-facilitator co and, and the, during the state, call, uh, the state, uh, state talk taking sorry, and the negotiation process. So, and now as one of the champion countries, as I was mentioning, so we would be very, very interested in, in hearing from you about uh, the, the approach of Mexico, in particular in this difficult phase, uh, uh, facing the impact of the, of the COVID on the population and also on the migrant. Particularly also if you also be able to frame uh, uh, what are actually the, the measures that the government and the community and the other stakeholders that have been taken and uh, uh, any useful uh, framework or experience that you would like to share with the rest of the community. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. At the outset, I'd want to thank the IOM for their invitation to participate in this uh, panel discussion, which is taking place in very uh, peculiar times and in extraordinary circumstances. And we're also facing the challenge of taking the floor on a Friday afternoon at 5 p.m., so that's quite a challenge. We all know that uh, amongst those who are most affected by this pandemic, uh, we'll find uh, migrants. Migrants that were already uh, a vulnerable group uh, before this crisis. Uh, these migrants uh, work and live in precarious conditions, which facilitate the spread of the virus. And we've seen outbreaks that have occurred in uh, places where there are many migrants throughout the world. Some of them need to face challenges to access health care and, and other basic services. Migrants are also those who are most affected by uh, economic consequences, and they are not provided with proper social protection measures. They are also victims of violence, discrimination, and xenophobia, and all of this uh, is a source of great concern. All these challenges uh, require inclusive public policy responses, especially when it comes to health matters, that to guarantee uh, the inclusion of all migrants in national response plans uh, to the pandemic, recognizing that the health of migrants uh, cannot be distinguished between the population's health in general. This includes uh, timely access to preventative tools and palliative care, as well as vaccines. We cannot uh, ignore the fact that current migratory flows uh, are uh, made up mostly of uh, women and girls, uh, uh, as well as uh, LGTB people that require different uh, healthcare services to reduce their specific vulnerabilities. Uh, similarly, uh, we need measures uh, to make sure that migrants, especially those that in, are in most precarious situations, be included in national and worldwide socioeconomic response and in recovery efforts. Throughout history, the contribution of migrants has been a crucial engine for development, and we know that it will continue to be an essential source of energy for the economic rebirth of our planet. Without a doubt, uh, in this uh, current situation, emergency situation, uh, states are facing huge challenges to define the public policies that will allow us to overcome the pandemic and its effects with a human rights focus. To guide us, we see a, a global compact for regularized migration as a, a really valuable tool. It's a framework based on cooperation, setting up international human rights standards and basing itself on it. That draws uh, the lines for better migratory policies, increased cooperation, and promote greater cooperation with UN agencies as well as other actors uh, to get a stronger and better governance for migratory matters, which is why Mexico, starting in June 2019, set up a national follow-up mechanism of the Covenants and Pacts goals uh, in which the different departments that cover migration participate. This uh, mechanism uh, monitors 177 programs and actions that are in line with uh, the guidelines of the pact and its 23 goals, which include activities to promote health and well-being of migrants during the pandemic. 
and I would like to share with you a few examples of these activities. In line with Article 15, uh, with um, Goal 15 of the Pact, which talks about migrant uh, migratory migrant access to services, we um, have taken steps to make sure that all migrants, regardless uh, of their condition, be ex uh, be able to exercise their right to health and have access to COVID-19 diagnostic tests, sexual and reproductive health services, and psychosocial support. Uh, another example is that we've given greater priority to um, the emergence from uh, uh, migratory centers of uh, um, vulnerable people such as pregnant women and the elderly. These were relocated uh, in accommodation where they would be provided with uh, proper care. In accordance with the principle of the greater interest of the child, uh, we have uh, referred all minor issues uh, to specialized civil society organizations. This is in accordance with uh, Goal 13, which uh, promotes uh, alternatives to uh, compulsory detention to address the vulnerable position of migrants. And in accordance with Goal 7, uh, we have set up a, a refuge, uh, refuges that can host migra uh, migrants that would otherwise be uh, on the street uh, and that might have uh, contracted the virus. These uh, temporary centers allow them to keep quarantine and remain in isolation. With a view to uh, spreading timely and useful information throughout the stages of migration and in line with goal three, uh, we have strengthened our teams. We call them uh, beta teams in our country, uh, which are people who work on borders and that are charged with providing preventative information, support and help to migrants with a human rights focus. In line with uh, Goal 17, uh, which uh, is the eradication of all forms of discrimination against migrants, we have uh, deployed campaigns to raise awareness uh, in society on the situation of migrants in the context of the pandemic and how they can exercise their rights. We are also committed with the empowerment of migrants, uh, and in accordance with Goal 16, uh, we have set up in our public health system not only migrants but also professionals uh, this has been possible thanks to uh, speeded up access uh, uh, to recognition for their degrees, which is also in line of goal 18 of uh, the pact. Uh, we all know full well that the pandemic has changed uh, our collective realities. Uh, it has increased inequalities, uh, depressed economies, uh, and has uh, laid bare the importance of multilateralism and international cooperation based on solidarity. The situation that we are currently facing is also an opportunity to build a better future. And the pact, just like the 2030 agenda, are roadmaps that can guide us in our way forward. I want to thank once again the IOM for its support, as well as those of other UN agencies, especially when it comes to implementing the pact's goals. And that we'll be paying close attention to all experiences that can be shared from other states in this discussion. And once again, thank you all. Thank you very much, Ambassador. You important pointed out really the lesson learning that the precarious and the vulnerability of migrants mean obviously precariousness of the whole community and also this emphasis on the importance of really conjugating our national aid policies with other important uh, social sectoral policies, really that is one of the, the tenets uh, of uh, the 360 degree approach of the, of the global compact. Important also, uh, and uh, the, the Mexico could actually ensure access to primary reproductive uh, health assistance, in particular for vulnerable women. And importance, once again, the emphasis of award, uh, awareness raising in the communities and among obviously the migrants. Thank you very much. Now, very happy to uh, uh, turn to uh, the ambassador of Portugal, Ambassador Rui Macieira. Uh, um, por Portugal, as Mexico, has been a country that has been more active on uh, uh, the um, all phases of the uh, um, approval and all now implementation of the Global Compact. Uh, your government is also uh, one of the first that has volunteered to come forward as a GCM champion. And uh, uh, so we would like to hear of your experience in dealing with the impact of the COVID and uh, how the, uh, is Portugal actually making use of the, of the global compact in this regard? 
Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and I'm very happy to follow on this panel uh, our colleague Sukur Flores with a wealth of experience and knowledge uh, on this matter, and of course the Mayor of Rabat City, where I was posted many, many years ago. <laughs> Um, first, I'd like to welcome this year's thematic international dialogue on migration, uh, which takes place under the COVID-19 uh, the pandemic. Um, this pandemic highlights the important part migrants play in our communities. It also shows the many challenges they face. The need for a more effective migration governance became even more crucial to shape inclusive actions in all phases of the pandemic. This has been demonstrated by the policy brief presented today. After nine months living, working and socializing in different ways and adapting to a new pandemic normal, there are good examples from all over the world ready to be debated and shared on migrants' rights protections and migrants' positive contributions to sustainable development. Let me share with you the Portuguese experience. From the very beginning, uh, Portugal engaged actively with a, with a global compact for safe, orderly and regular migration. We believe this is an unprecedented opportunity for a comprehensive integrated approach to international migration, minimizing factors that exacerbate vulner vulnerability at different stages of migration. Portugal planned and implemented its own practical framework. We were the first to establish a national plan for the implementation of the GCM. In line with its 23 objectives, the national plan encompasses 97 actions under a ministerial coordination committee chaired by the Minister of State for the Presidency, based on an intercultural model of diversity management, with joint and concerted work of state and non-government actors. The national plan and its coordination committee reflect our whole of government and whole of society approach to migration. The willingness and the capacity to implement the GCM, seeking better management of the international migration phenomena, translated in our recognition as a champion country. We're very proud of this recognition. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Portugal used its governance model for migration that had just been put into place to mitigate the negative impacts of the crisis. In doing so, we aimed to protect human rights and shape a more inclusive and organized method to address future crises. COVID-19's response and recovery efforts meant implementing several measures aligned with the GCM, ensuring a dignified and human rights approach on preparedness, prevention, response and recovery of this international public health emergency. First, Portugal secured access to health care for SARS-CoV-2 infections to all, irrespective of migration status. Migrants were exempt of charges for the diagnosis and treatment. COVID-19 information materials were translated into several languages. Mediation and translation services were put in place to facilitate migrants' interaction with the National Health Service. Since the first case was diagnosed on the 2nd of March, 265 translation services have been provided. These actions strengthened the access to basic services and created conditions for migrants to fully contribute to sustainable development, as stated in Objectives 5 and 19 of the GCM. Second, aiming at facilitating regular migration support vulnerable families and maintain jobs and labor market, Portugal decided to grant temporary residence rights to all migrants and asylum seekers with pending applications. This measure became valid when the state of national emergency came into force and was further extended until 30 of October. Given the mobility constraints posed by the pandemic, visa arrangements for seasonal workers were also adjusted. Since July 2020, a new e-platform allowed for the renewable of 50,000 residence permits, allowing migrants to access social support and medical care. These measures align with objectives four and five of the GCM, as they guarantee that migrants have adequate documentation and they improve the availability and flexibility of pathways for regular migration. 
In line with Objective 16 of the GCM, which aims to empower migrants and communities for full inclusion and social cohesion, Portugal has worked with children and young people under a vulnerable situation. This is under the umbrella of, of a program called Programa Escolhas, which aims to reduce dropout rates and promote responsible and inclusive entrepreneurship. The program continued during the confinement period, focusing mainly on promoting continued access to education. Portugal has continued to deliver on the GCM Objective 5, promoting negotiations on labour mobility agreements. In September, in collaboration with IOM, the Portuguese government organised a technical webinar on labour mobility, emphasising the mutual gains of concerted routes, not only for states, but also for migrants. Throughout the pandemic, the Portuguese government continued to support the return of Portuguese citizens through its consular network, as well as to increase partnerships for development with countries of origin and transit. With these, we aim to build on GCM Objective 14. Ladies and gentlemen, as human beings, we are all vulnerable to disease. It is our duty to ensure that we do not add other layers of vulnerability that undermine our efforts to minimize the impact of the disease. The examples shared with you demonstrate that Portugal attaches the utmost importance to applying the GCM values and commitments to the COVID-19 preparedness, response and recovery efforts. In addition, and looking ahead to the presidency of the European Union in the first half of 2021, Portugal reaffirms the goal of making Europe more inclusive and equitable respecting the humanitarian principles. In these challenging times, solidarity and debate on international migration and COVID-19 will shed light on ways to provide a more efficient response while also advising on how to move forward further towards social cohesion, inclusion and community resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for um highlighting the, first, the positive contribution of migrants, obviously, to sustainable development. It was very interesting uh, to uh, uh, hear about the National Implementation Plan established in 97 major, in particular, the importance, obviously, of this interministerial coordination mechanism that actually is foundation for an all of a government and all of society, society approach that you also rightly mentioned. Concretely, obviously, and not worthing the importance, obviously, of ensuring the continuity of the status of migrants and asylum seekers that Portugal has ensured through the extension of the emergency extension and the renewal of permit to prevent a migrant from falling in the irregularity and obviously, as you mentioned, becoming a societal problem. And also thank you for uh, highlighting the holistic nature of the, the global compact and also once again, stressing the value that have actually brought together the international community and they've actually inspired us for its approval and now implementation. Thank you very much. I understand uh, the mayor of uh, Accra is not uh, available. So since actually the principle and also the, the, the expression of uh, all of society has been uh, uh, echoing uh, uh, time and again, uh, and uh, obviously, uh, uh, they could not be really a, a full of uh, all, uh, holistic approach without the contribution of the civil society. Uh, the, um, one of the more, ac more active uh, uh, stakeholders and partners of the UN in the United Nations uh, um, Migration Network uh, is the ACT Alliance. And uh, um, I'm here with us is uh, Christian Wolf, is the, uh, uh, not only the, the project manager of uh, the uh, ACT Alliance, and, uh, but also the um, uh, co-leader of the working group on uh, regular pathways that has actually been developing his uh, plan of action. And uh, it's also the, the, one of the most advanced plan of action that we have actually been uh, working on as part of the network. So I would like to, to ask, ask Christian, obviously, as a representative of the, uh, uh, of the ACT Alliance, but also partner uh, in the network, what are your views and perspective on what the, the G, GCM actually can offer in, uh, uh, as a framework to uh, coordinate uh, an effective response uh, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Christian, the floor is, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, for the invitation. 
to speak here today. We're also grateful for the support uh, from civil society colleagues, uh, including members of ACT Alliance, the, the Global Coalition on Migration, and the Civil Society Action Committee, as well as, as you mentioned, the, the many civil society stakeholders that, are, that have been active in the various working groups of the UN Network on Migration. Um, I'd like to recall again briefly the, the Secretary General's remarks about COVID-19 being an opportunity to reimagine human mobility and, and really reflect on how timely and significant those were. Um, he, he makes four points uh, in his brief, which were to, one, build on the recognition of the vital role played by migrants to redouble our efforts to combat discrimination against them. Secondly, to ensure that those in need of protection are able to safely and promptly access it. Thirdly, to health-proof human mobility systems. And finally, to strengthen global migration governance and responsibility sharing for refugees. I include that here because he, I think, very consciously used the term people on the move, as the IOMDG has also done and the uh, High Commissioner for Refugees have also done over the last few months, which we think is a, is a move in a good direction to, to be this inclusive. Now, these steps had already been envisaged by the Global Compacts for Refugees and the Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, both of which, of course, have their foundations in, in relevant international human rights and refugee instruments. Therefore, the steps to be taken in response to COVID-19, including and in particular those necessary to protect people on the move, do not require acts of, of charity or new sets of concessions by states. They simply require sticking to what we've already agreed to. Um, but in a way, and, and that's the, the point, that reimagines mobility not as a threat or a burden, but as an integral part of all of our lives and migrants and refugees themselves not as a drain on, but an enrichment of these lives. Um, we tend to agree, I think, with the overall argument of the paper that was presented earlier that the GCM can be an important tool for furthering international cooperation on migration, especially in the context of COVID-19. And it would be good to have a, have a quick look here at how we've fared in that regard in, in recent months. Um, and, and I won't repeat everything that, that's been said over the last couple of days already, but just to say that, again, the, the pandemic has highlighted a number of crucial issues in the way in which it, it has affected populations on the move, uh, raising health, socioeconomic protection, and inclusion issues, among others. Um, looking, therefore, at actual state responses over the last few months, we've noticed a few things. One, we've, we've heard several uh, positive examples, also here on the panel today um, to, to the pandemic uh, in, in relation to migration, which have included uh, release of migrants from detention, uh, regularization of undocumented migrants under certain conditions, as well as facilitation of access to health care, unemployment and other subsistence support, and other services, regardless of status. Nevertheless, in many cases, these measures have sort of had the character of a time-bound emergency response to an extraordinary situation that we're all facing, rather than a due recognition of the role and contribution of migrants in our societies that should come with this role, thereby somewhat, until now at least, limiting their transformative potential. And I'll return to that in a minute. In this sense, and just by way of example, the pandemic has served to illustrate the extent to which current forms of regular migration programs have failed migrant workers by setting up separate systems in many destination countries that exclude them from social safety nets, including stimulus, unemployment benefits, health care, and other social protections. Unfortunately, we also continue to see examples of negative COVID-19 responses, uh, with people on the move either being denied access to territory, including the right to seek asylum, having their employment prematurely and irregularly terminated, being forced to return to their countries of origin sometimes into high-risk areas in times of COVID, and becoming targets of xenophobic attacks and hate, all in the guise of a protective, quote-unquote, intent in the context of a public health crisis. Turning back to the GCM as a tool, we, we could spend a lot of time, of course, um, dissecting each objective in the GCM with a view toward what it yields in terms of uh, COVID-related guidance. But allow me to just focus on uh, two objectives in particular here, one being Objective 7 with regard to its usefulness in guiding responses to, to the pandemic, and Objective 5 with a view towards 
uh, recovery. Objective seven, as you know, is, is intended to address and reduce vulnerabilities in migration, for example, by facilitating status transition to avoid irregularity, enabling individual status assessments and avoiding arbitrary expulsions and supporting referral and assistance from migrants in such situations and in developing comprehensive policies at national level that take account of migrants. Um, imagine how much easier it could have been for states to respond to the needs of migrants during the pandemic if these measures had already been in place instead of having to scramble for humanitarian responses in the moment. That's not to deny the positive, uh, positive aspects of measures that states have taken, but just to, to uh, underline how important it is to, to do advanced planning for this and to continue to develop this together. Objective five then, looking at recovery, calls on states to enhance the availability and flexibility of pathways in a manner that responds to the needs of migrants in a situation of vulnerability. And then, then goes on to list several categories. And, and this really gets to the heart of what needs to be done, I think, to transform migration governance systems in a way that takes the rights of migrants seriously and comprehensively addresses the situation that is so vividly illustrated by COVID-19 by developing a variety of practices for admission and stay that respond to a, a very broad set of precarious situations with an honest reimagining of what regular pathways should look like. Objective five, therefore, you could argue in many ways is a keystone of GCM implementation and solutions in many related areas would cascade quite logically from focusing on this objective. Now, if we pull the lens back a bit further still, we could then take a look at, to take the next step and invoke objective two to more holistically address the various drivers behind migration in situations of, of vulnerability, including, and I bring this up because it's particularly relevant also in the context of recovery, the impacts of climate change. Um, I'd like to again quote the Secretary General here, he's been on a roll this year, uh, who in a separate statement uh, commented on the need for sustainable COVID-19 recovery plans that tackle climate change, um, that keep us in line with what the science tells us and that also prioritize the most vulnerable people and communities. Applying this perspective would then also include recognizing pathways for labor migration, for livelihood support as part of adaptation and building resilience as part of addressing adverse drivers and averting and minimizing displacement. Regular pathways have always been crucial to safe, orderly, and regular migration. Civil society stakeholders, as you know, have insisted on this throughout the negotiations, and the, the resulting commitments to expand the pathways were perhaps not as strong as they might have been. Nevertheless, we are now in a situation where the stakes are much, much higher. It's essential to find ways to operationalize shared responsibility between countries of origin and destination for protecting migrants, labor, and human rights, including through concrete work on who is responsible for what aspects of social protection, including access to health care and to earned benefits, and how to hold private actors accountable who are obliged to provide benefits. As you may know, guidance on how to implement related GCM commitments is currently being drafted by the network's thematic working groups, in addition to the work being done in the core working groups, which was presented earlier, to be followed by pilot testing, which will have to include an honest discussion of promising as well as worrying practices guided by the experience of migrants themselves. And we really hope that, you know, as this guidance gets rolled out, we, we will be able to use that as a platform to really experiment with more, more participatory models of, of policy implementation there. Um, I think it was very illuminating yesterday to see the, in the pre presentation from Bangladesh how all the critical issues affecting migrant workers are still with us and have been brought into even sharper focus by the pandemic, which has perhaps led to renewed urgency um, and expanded the cycle of awareness among stakeholders, if you will. Um, it also highlights, I think, the importance of international collaboration, um, which is an aspect that is perhaps too often missing from reflections on COVID-19 responses. Also here, we've, we've heard a lot of talk about what individual countries are doing. I think we need to think about in the next step, what we can do to enhance uh, joint discussion of what that means. Um, and perhaps the upcoming uh, regional reviews of the GCM may provide a useful space for furthering multilateral and multi-stakeholder discussions on this. So in closing, the degree to which the GCM can serve as a blueprint for successful and inclusive COVID-19 response depends largely on government's willingness to not only reverse what are overtly discriminatory 
policies and practices, but also on their readiness to transcend emergency mode and enter transformation mode when it comes to their GCM commitments in this context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Let me start from this very last point, really important. Obviously, you highlighting the, the importance of political uh, willingness it goes beyond resources, obviously. And uh, as you mentioned, as the possibility of reimagining mobility, what actually be left at the end of, uh, of the tunnel and uh, what uh, uh, outlook actually uh, we will uh, be working on. Obviously, there are another number of important actors that uh, have been uh, uh, mentioned and uh, 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 with whom it's fundamental to work, obviously, member of the diaspora, uh, the private sector, faith-based uh, uh, institution, union, and the migrant community themselves. Uh, in, uh, in a way, I also uh, found very, very important and useful you are outlining the complementarity between the Global Compact for Migration and the Global Compact for Refugees. And to the regard, obviously, within the network, uh, the importance of the uh, Secretary General initiative uh, to hold uh, uh, return and uh, um, readmission and expulsions during the COVID emergency that has been heeded and implemented, uh, as, and as we heard uh, earlier in the previous panel. What will be left? Uh, possibly a much uh, a, a nimble uh, practice of uh, communication flexible and more connected uh, uh, platform, uh, once again, to, to make sure that all services are actually provided in a cost-effective and, 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 uh, and time-effective way. And, and you mentioned at the end the importance of really making this variety of practice available. The UN network, uh, to that regard, is actually is an important platform and repository through uh, the work that is been uh, uh, now conducting for the development uh, of the knowledge-based platform that will be really enabling the international community, the partner, actually to share, and when possible, mutual aid practices. And um, with that, I would like to thank uh, the uh, panelists for, uh, for their uh, input and contribution. Uh, I think I haven't left anyone uh, uh, behind, uh, and that we have, uh, I mean, a generous half an hour for uh, intervention, although uh, my list is quite lengthy. And uh, if you agree, I would like to start really opening uh, uh, the space for uh, uh, intervention and questions and comments uh, by uh, uh, giving the floor to the Deputy Foreign Minister of Armenia that uh, probably joined us from uh, Yerevan, His Excellency Artak Apitonian. Uh, recognizes the need for a comprehensive approach in order to maximize the overall benefits of migration while addressing the risks and challenges in countries of origin, transit, and destination. This is why Sweden voted for the Global Compact uh, for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration as a non-legally binding 360-degree vision multilateral cooperative framework uniting most of the UN and IOM member states. The implementation of the GCM is already in progress, but has been stalled to some extent by the COVID-19 pandemic. Migrants are often vulnerable, both in terms of working on the front line in healthcare and hospitality, risking their own health, and as they are more prone to lose their jobs as a result of the ensuing economic crisis. There's also been a substantial dent in the flow of remittances due to the pandemic. The introduction of travel bans and reinforced border controls have presented migrants with additional challenges. So, while acknowledging the need for decisive measures aimed at curbing the, global, global, uh, the current global health crisis, we emphasize that safe, orderly, and regular migration is a positive phenomenon that should be promoted, not curtailed. In order to strengthen international cooperation and global partnerships for safe, orderly, and regular migration, Sweden has recently made a number of financial contributions that address uh, both short-term needs tied to the pandemic as well as more long-term strategic goals. In both 2019 and 2020, Sweden provided IOM with around $10 million annually in core funding. A part of this funding was lightly earmarked to strengthen IOM's internal capacity to coordinate the UN network on migration thus contributing to the UN system support to member states' implementation of the GCM. Sweden has also provided around 
$340,000 to the UN Migration Multi-Partner Trust Fund for implementation of GCM-related projects in developing countries, thus further strengthening migration management and cooperation in third countries. In this context, we are glad to note that the Migration Fund has taken steps to allow for changes to concept notes for projects receiving funding in order to take into account the effects of the ongoing pandemic. Furthermore, the Swedish government offices will use the compact as a frame of reference when evaluating potential beneficiaries of grants for migration projects provided by the Ministry of Justice. An example of where this has already been achieved is the grant of around $44,000 to IOM for the establishment and launch of the Global Policy Network on Ethical Recruitment. Once up and running, the network is expected to provide member states with tools that will assist in the delivery of GCM objectives 7, 19, and 23. I am grateful to IOM for providing this opportunity to discuss key issues for global, regional, and bilateral cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Nordlin, for uh, uh, the pivotal role that uh, Sweden has been uh, uh, um, having and obviously in the, been playing on the constraints also that your country is facing in the implementation and indeed obviously for the support to the contribution to uh, IOM role as the coordinator and secretarial of the uh, network, which is highly appreciated. I would now uh, like to uh, give the floor to uh, Ms. Daniela Real, or Reale of Save the Children. I don't know if she is in the, ho in the room or online. She, she left, right. So we move on quickly along. Oh, here, okay, Ms. Uh, Ms. Reale, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, giving us uh, the opportunity to speak, uh, Mr. Chairman. This statement is actually on behalf of uh, the Initiative for Child Rights in the Global Compact, which is a network of over 30 agencies um, united to ensure that the Global Compact will work for children in practice. It is called Child Rights for Children and by Ted de Zon. And um, three years since the adoption of the Global Compact for Migration, the initiative continues to support it's a child-centered approach and child-sensitive guiding principle. Um, if the GCM, we believe if the GCM is implemented with children at its heart, it has the potential of enhancing the protection and support for children in migration. Now, the pandemic is hitting people on the move particularly hard, and um, it has actually increased the urgency for multilateral cooperation, which is embedded in the GCM implementation. We have heard today some positive examples, um, but some COVID-19 response measures have been harmful for people in migration, have exacerbated their existing vulnerabilities and violated their rights in some cases and increased discrimination. In DCM, um, we believe, outlines alternative measures that can be helpful in responding to COVID-19. And uh, today we would like to highlight three areas where the pandemic has exacerbated the risk for children on the move face and for which the GCM can be useful. Firstly, um, access to um, the unprecedented disruption that we're seeing on access to uh, education. Um, it has made more difficult for children in migration to access learning opportunities and possibly their return to school altogether. School closures also further exacerbate GBV risks and gender-based inequalities and making, making children and girls more vulnerable. So we recommend investing in school reopening plans that are inclusive of all children, irrespective of status, gender, or disability, and include the specific needs of migrant children. And the GCM provides policy options for improved cooperation on access to education for children in the context of migration. Secondly, children are facing increased risks of violence, um, of exploitation, of abuse, and separation from their caregivers. Um, just as these risks have increased, access to child protection and psychosocial services have decreased following COVID. So we recommend that child protection, GBV, and psychosocial services be prioritized and resourced, and the need for all children 
including migrant children, responded to, that social workers be classed as essential workers and unable to reach all children, and that social protection and child benefit programs be accessible to displaced children. Again, the GCM outlines how to provide child protection support for vulnerable migrant children, including unaccompanied children, and to name just two objectives, seven and 12 key such, um, um, such um, indications. Thirdly, um, with border closures, we're seeing greater restriction on accessing countries and services. And family reunification options are being reduced, and detention and forced returns um, are being used in some cases, increasingly so. Now, with reduced options for safe and regular pathways, we see we risk seeing children really be pushed to embark on more dangerous journeys. And the GCM outlines options for increasing regular pathways and ending the immigration detention of children and implementing alternatives. Um, finally, we would like to, um, um, to say that uh, if we want to succeed in implementing the GCM and in responding to COVID-19, we must treat children and young people as partners in identifying the concrete needs and finding sustainable solutions. Their meaningful participation should be at the core of everything we do. Um, the initiative will be uh, planning some roundtables um, in the uh, lead up to the regional um, um, the regional reviews, and, um, and that will be a contribution that we aim to um, to make and involve young people and children and raise children voices. Thank you very much for giving us the floor. It is us to thank you, Ms. Reale, for obviously zooming in the situation of, of uh, children. Of, you know, child sensitive is one of the, the guiding principles of the, the Global Compact. And also, thank you for your engagement in uh, the process, and in particular, the process of review of the uh, current uh, uh, implementation stage. Thank you very much. I have now in, uh, on my list uh, Mr. Param uh, Idari of the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran, the counselor of the permanent mission uh, in Geneva. Mr. Haidari, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, moderator. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank IOM for convening this international dialogue on migration. And also my thanks go to the, uh, goes to the <clears throat> panelists for their rich and valuable discussion and deliberation during these two days. The people on the move, including refugees and displaced persons and other foreign nationals, are among most vulnerable people. Their situation has further worsened amid COVID-19 pandemic. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, which has hit my country worse, Iran has taken a wide range of measures to ensure our foreign nationals have access to adequate health care services so they, can, are, they, they are fully included in the national COVID-19 response. Foreign nationals like Iranians enjoy universal health coverage and many of them receive free of charge health care services such as COVID-19 related tests, treatment and hospitalization. During the, these two days meeting, it has been emphasized that the impact of the pandemic has demonstrated that no one can be saved until we are all saved. And only through an inclusive approach to really leaving no one behind can the safety and the well-being of, of all be achieved. Mr. Moderator, regrettably, the US government has tightened its illegal and inhuman sanction in spite of the numerous calls by the Secretary General of the United Nations, United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, and some other prominent international figures for lifting unilateral sanction in the, uh, in the midst of the global pandemic. The U.S. brutal sanction contradicting the principle and concept of leave no one behind as they push everyone behind. Sanctions have also narrowed the space for humanitarian operation by politicizing humanitarian assistance uh, to the people on the move and jeopardizing the activities of the humanitarian community. We propose one uh, recommendation 
for this meeting to this effect as following. Recalling the appeal of the United Nations Secretary General for lifting of sanctions amid pandemic and expressing grave concern at negative consequences of the unilateral coercive measures on humanitarian operation and on the health and living condition of vulnerable people, we recommend the IOM to address the negative impact of the sanctions on humanitarian operation and on people under its mandate. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Many thanks, the representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran. I now would like to give the floor to Ms. Chiara Shissa, representative of a UN Mayor Group for Children and Youth. Ms. Shissa, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, moderator, and thanks to the panelists for the insightful presentations. On behalf of the United Nations Mayor Group for Children and Youth, I would like to deepen the discussion started by Save the Children on COVID-19 and its impact on migrant children and minors. Irregular children and minors are in fact particularly vulnerable to violence and exploitation, something that COVID-19 may exacerbate. Migrant children are indeed uniquely vulnerable to dangers and traumas that could jeopardize their well-being and development and therefore should be provided with child-specific and child-centered care. However, this is often not, not the case. For instance, as noted by the UN Network on Migration Policy Brief, some unaccompanied children have been removed during the pandemic without due process or individual assessment, thus violating not only their human rights, but also potentially compromising their health. So my question for the panelists, therefore, is how can the Global Compact for Migration be leveraged to protect the best interest of the child and the children's fundamental rights? How to integrate a truly child-centered approach into international migration governance? Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, uh, Ms. Shisa. We will uh, put through your question to, to the panel at the end uh, of uh, the interventions. May I now ask uh, the deputy uh, permanent representative of uh, Ecuador, Mr. Davalos, to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mauricio. Unfortunately, my DPR is not here in the room. El Ecuador agradece a la OIM y resalta la importancia de este panel dedicado al Pacto Mundial para la Migración Segura, Ordenada y Regular. Luego de dos años, es pertinente fortalecer el intercambio de experiencias sobre su implementación. La pandemia del COVID-19 constituye un desafío sin precedentes por la crisis sanitaria, social, económica y de protección que afecta de manera particular a la movilidad humana. Simultáneamente, los principios y los objetivos del Pacto Mundial para una Migración han cobrado aún más relevancia por la pandemia. Varios compromisos se enfocan en fortalecer los servicios consulares, brindar a los migrantes acceso a servicios básicos como atención médica y reducir las vulnerabilidades durante la migración como una gestión fronteriza integral y coordinada. Igualmente, son relevantes los compromisos para promover que las remesas sean más rápidas, seguras y económicas, así como para fomentar la inclusión financiera de los migrantes. De particular relevancia es el objetivo para fortalecer y mejorar la cooperación internacional. Todos estos objetivos del pacto son la guía para que los migrantes estén en el centro de las acciones para combatir la pandemia y para la recuperación de la misma. El Ecuador otorga gran importancia en la implementación del pacto, lo cual se evidencia en la Agenda Nacional para la Igualdad de Movilidad Humana 2017-2021, en la que el pacto es uno de los instrumentos rectores. Esta Agenda Nacional es la base para el desarrollo de políticas migratorias para todos los actores y al mismo tiempo para generar mecanismos de coordinación y acciones conjuntas en todas las funciones y entidades del Estado. El propósito de esta agenda es promover procesos migratorios seguros, ordenados y regulares, en línea con los compromisos internacionales y los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. El Pacto Mundial no debe ser solo un documento de aspiraciones, pues se deriva de la Declaración de Nueva York, 
que surgió para enfrentar una crisis sin precedentes de refugiados y migrantes, por lo que el pacto es una hoja de ruta esencial para la gobernanza de la migración internacional y coadyuva a la creación de un sistema solidario, responsable y predecible. La realidad es que la migración continuará y se incrementará, por lo que corresponde a todos, estados, autoridades locales, sociedad civil, organizaciones no gubernamentales y sector privado, demostrar de manera conjunta el valor agregado del pacto, como un marco de coordinación y cooperación que abarca todas las dimensiones de la migración para defender y proteger los derechos humanos, reducir vulnerabilidades y fomentar la contribución de los migrantes a sus comunidades y así asegurar sociedades más resilientes y que nadie quede atrás. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Marta. I regret that the Deputy Permanent Representative could not be with us. Thank you. Uh, I have now in uh, my list the representative of uh, Bangladesh uh, in the room or online video conference. Bangladesh, you have the floor. Thank you. Mr. Moderator, I'm actually in the room. Sorry about that. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I also thank the distinguished panelists for their thoughtful presentations. As all previous speakers have mentioned, the COVID-19 has disproportionately affected the migrants. They have been facing multiple challenges, including the denial of access to health services. Thousands of migrants are reportedly facing grim reality of losing jobs as well as forced return. This situation has arisen as there had not been significant efforts to address the global migration, to address the problems the global migration had been facing since long. The Global Compact on Migration underlined a global call to build an inclusive society that recognizes the challenges of the migrants and makes an effort to address them. The plight of the migrants surfaced during the COVID-19 has once again reminded us of the urgent necessity of the implementation of the GCM at the national, regional, and the global levels. The GCM, through its 360-degree vision, 10 cross-cutting guiding principles and 23 standalone but integrated objectives, provides a practical framework to help governments and stakeholders to leverage migration for a comprehensive and resilient recovery from the pandemic. Our recovery measures must emphasize on building resilience of the vulnerable people, including all migrants, irrespective of their status. In this context, a collective effort synergizing the regional and the international processes for accelerating the greater implementation of the GCM is important. We stress that the UN Network on Migration, as mandated to support implementation of the GCM, step up its efforts in both origin and destination countries. Scaling up the multi-partner trust fund is also crucial. Mr. Moderator, Bangladesh has consistently advocated for harnessing the development potentials of migration, promoting the rights of migrants, and fostering meaningful international cooperation for migration governance. We significantly contributed to the discourse of the GCM. Likewise, Bangladesh stands ready to render full cooperation to the collective efforts to combat migrants' vulnerabilities through implementation of the GCM. I thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Bangladesh. I've just been told that uh, um, the Honorable Mayor of Accra is online. If you don't mind, if you have still some stamina left, uh, and uh, you would uh, uh, allow me to actually uh, give uh, the mayor uh, uh, the floor. Um, so Honorable uh, Mohamed uh, Ajay Sowa, the mayor of uh, Accra, uh, sir, you have uh, the floor. Thank you. There is a proper communication. Uh, we have to let uh, the interpreter service actually close at 6.15, uh, 6 so we'll need to 
hurry up and we will not be able to take, yes, okay, other intervention. Thank you. Mr. Sowa, uh, sorry, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. I'm afraid we can't hear you. Hello, can you hear us? Oh, there, is, there is a problem with the sound and the mics, I'm afraid. Still, uh, we can't connect. Anybody you'd like to, uh, any, any way to help? Uh, with sincere apologies, uh, we won't be able actually to hold on much longer because obviously the interpreter have been extremely <laughs> Uh, taxed uh, during the, the whole two days. So uh, please uh, bear with us, sir, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able actually to include your intervention in, uh, in the minutes of, uh, of the meeting. Can you hear us? I can hear you now. Yes, we can hear you apparently. So uh, please go ahead. You have the floor. Thank you very much. And, and let me say a very good evening from Uh, we've been asked to join in the discussion of this very important subject um, on, on migration during this period of COVID-19. Um, let me say that Accra remains at the, uh, the most transit point for the people of West Africa and also for people traveling outside Africa because of the air. Uh, and we have uh, almost everybody in um, West Africa um, uh, within our city center. And therefore, um, taking care of their interests and their safety is paramount to us. Um, because uh, a crowd tout, um, and even the nation tout um, uh, at the a city of receiving visitors and welcoming visitors and let visitors uh, feeling safe. However, it's also important to say that because um, Accra remains at the business hub, all manner of trading activities brings people also to Accra. And it is in that regard that working closely with migrants and keeping them safe, it's very, very important. Fortunately, uh, in Accra, a lot of migrants live in communities where they can be more identifiable. So for instance, the people from Niger, you have a community where you can find a lot of Nigerians in the city, part of the city like Nima, same as Burkinabids and Ivorians and all, you know, and Liberians, you know, we used to have a whole city, uh, a whole community full of um, Liberians. So working closely with these migrants, it's very important because they are part of the city and they have also contributed to the development of the city. But more importantly, as we go through this COVID-19 pandemic and our activities is not discriminatory. For us, anybody who is within the city, it's, it's been taken care of like a Ghanaian. We hardly in our part of the world try to find out who you are and where you are coming from, whether you are a Ghanaian before you receive benefit or support from the city or not. It is not part of our standard practice. So discrimination is not a common feature in the things that we do in Accra. But we also take note that uh, if there are communities or individual migrants who have um, uh, peculiar issues, they are also being taken care of. And uh, we want to commend your your team for the work that you are doing. And we believe that um, as we move on, uh, we'll further integrate the migrants into our city culture and the things that we do. But the platform is open for all of us and we are happy that we are working with the migrants within our city in this period of pandemic, where we provided free meals, we provided cash 
to people who needed money to so that they can start their business. All these efforts are being made so that uh, we can live peacefully and happily within the city center. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for uh, sharing the experience of uh, the city of Accra in promoting safe and coordinated migration, uh, especially towards a vulnerable group uh, during the pandemic. And uh, so uh, as uh, Accra is one of the partic city participating in uh, the local migration governance indicator, there are some interesting uh, clues coming out of uh, the uh, work uh, that uh, we have been doing together. We thank you once again for uh, uh, the patience and despite these uh, little glitches for being with us until now. Thank you once again. Right, I'm afraid we have really a, a, the need to close uh, uh, quickly. I have two uh, uh, more interventions on my list. I would like to give the floor now to the representative of Turkey. There is no time. No, no, we need, to, we need to close. Uh, they, we will publish and they can I'm send afraid them. apparently Sorry. so. The interpreter services is actually 15 mi minutes over time and we will not be able to provide services. So I would like to invite uh, the representative of Turkey and Armenia requested a re reply to present their contribution and they will actually be uh, included in uh, the minutes of the proceedings of the meeting. And we thank you very much for your patience and understanding. With that, I would like to once again to thank you all the uh, panelists that have actually been giving their valuable contribution and uh, also to the panel, but uh, more important beyond that, also to the support of the implementation of the GCM at this trying time and to be with us uh, at, until this uh, very late time of the day. And I would like now to hand, uh, uh, hand over to the uh, Chief of Staff of IUM, uh, uh, Eugenio Ambrosi, for uh, a few uh, closing remarks of uh, the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>